Hello everyone, today on Scottish Memories we are going to be chatting to Gordon Tree. How are you all? Hope you are all happy and healthy and well out there. Just before we get started today, just remember wherever you listen to Scottish Memories, if you wouldn't mind giving us a follow on wherever you get your podcast, leave a review, that would be great, that would really help us out. Or if you watch on YouTube, please remember to subscribe to the channel as well. But today, I'm over the moon to be chatting to Gordon Tree. You may recognise Gordon as one of the senior reporters and presenters for STV News. Gordon, hello, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm brilliant. I'm brilliant. Thank you so much for taking the time and coming on and chatting to me. It's so nice to have you here. Well, thanks for having me on. It, 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 we were just kind of saying, this must be a little bit odd for you to be on the answering side of the questions this time around. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm much more comfortable with asking the questions. So uh, <laughs> yeah, be prepared for me turning it around at some point. No, that's fine. That's fine. I can't guarantee that, you know, anything I say will be compass mentis, but that's absolutely fine. <laughs> so before we get started, how are you? How is everything? You happy and healthy and well? Yes, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I've been busy the last few weeks. Um, two weeks ago, I was um, up in uh, Dundee, which um, for those who don't know is where I'm from originally. And obviously it's changed a huge amount in recent years with the the V and A, and the reason I was there was looking at the um, the computer games industry, which is huge. Dundee is like the epicenter of that, and you know, for people of our age, will remember Lemmings back in the, the early nineties. That's what kind of started it all, and um, then Grand Theft Auto, of course. But now it's like forty game developers based in Dundee. And they're building very exciting thing, and it's going to be a big tourist attraction too. They're going to be building an esports arena. So, what's an esports arena? Well, who'd have thought that it would become a sport to go and watch other people playing computer games? But that's what it is. Four thousand seats, which is bigger than a lot of football grounds in Scotland. Yeah. I guess they must be confident they're going to fill it, or they wouldn't be building it. But that'll be another big tourist attraction coming to Dundee in 2024. That's brilliant. Yeah. that's br- It's funny, I've, 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 I've mentioned someone else who was it, I can't remember who it was, but Dundee, I don't want to say it's going through a bit of a renaissance, but it's definitely, see, on the up sounds like it was down, but, the, you know, there's there's a vibe about Dundee now. There's a, It's definitely, it's becoming more of a hub, I suppose. Yeah, and look at that kind of waterfront area right when i was a kid the waterfront um had the the swimming pool which was built i think in the 1970s and was a 1970s concrete building and the next door to it they then built a hotel which looked like a prison from the outside and so that was like the first thing you saw and you know i've always thought and when i was growing up there you tend not to see this because you wouldn't be coming into Dundee, you'd be going out of it. But when you drive over, if you come from Fife and drive over the Tay Bridge into Dundee, it's probably the most sort of spectacular location and layout of all the cities in Scotland that is sort of spread out in front of you. A colleague actually, a few years ago, I remember saying he took his uh, young son, he was from Dundee as well, took his young son to Dundee to visit the grandparents. And as they were driving over the Tay Bridge, he was like, dad, is this New York? And (laughs) You know, it seems funny, but you can kind of see where, you know, from a kind of five-year-old, that might be the idea. So now, of course, all that sort of 70s concrete has been kind of swept away. You've got the V&A there. Obviously, the Discovery has taken pride of place. Um, There's a a big square and open space where they do concerts and things. And, yeah, it's totally transformed. And I think on one hand... That's great. It's brought a lot of investment in. It's brought a lot of attention. I think without getting too kind of heavy about it, it's also maybe masked some of the ongoing problems. You know, Dundee's got a big drugs problem and a lot of work has been done on that. Um, so there are those kind of two sides to it. But the the fact that there are people from outside coming to visit more than they ever would before and the fact that there is this um, investment and interest, I think that can only help rather than hinder 
dealing with anything that's a pre-existing problem. So I think the it, it's it's hugely impressive, and I think, and I can say this being from there originally, everyone who goes to visit Dundee is far more positive about it than people who are from there. And I think <laughs> that's actually the case in some ways for Scots as a whole, isn't it? Everyone else speaks better about Scot. Actually, the UK as a whole, everyone else speaks about it better. You know, it's like it's a kind of national trait to be kind of like, uh, you we're know. Very, we're very self-deprecating. Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah sometimes yeah, yeah. we need to just look at what's around us and think, you know, this is pretty good, isn't it? And there's loads of places um, across the country. I'm fortunate that my job gets me all around the country and you get to go places and see places that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise go. And it's, it's a huge privilege to see so much that's around us that I think we take for granted a lot of the time. You, 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 you couldn't have nailed it better, really. We're, we, we don't take advantage of how incredible this this country is. Um, I, I was going to, like Dundee as well, there's, there's one part of Dundee and it's a silly little thing but I love it. I love the fact they've got a statue of Desperate Dan. <laughs> yes. And that's, uh, I guess, how long has that been there now? Probably, I, I think in some ways in my head it's relatively recent, but it's probably been there for like 20 years. But um, it's such a, it's all become a sort of landmark, that Desperate yeah. Dan statue. And, you know, the funny thing about it, um, there was a drama a couple of years ago, it's, I had a second series more recently, but a couple of years ago, a drama called Traces, which is about forensic science. It was based on a book by Val McDermott, set in Dundee. And unfortunately, as the way these things work um, with kind of TV drama production sometimes, the place that it's set is not where it's filmed. And most yeah. of it was filmed in Bolton, pretending to be Dundee. And how did they make people believe it was Dundee? Well, you know, Here's a stock shot of the V&A. Here's a stock shot of the Desperate Dan statue. Cut then to a bit of dialogue, which is happening in Bolton High Street, but because you showed the Desperate Dan statue, it's Dundee. And it has become that kind of recognisable thing, yeah. I, I, I genuinely don't think there's probably, and, and I suppose for anyone listening to this anywhere outside of Britain, really, I can't think of anywhere else that's got a statue based on a comic strip. I may be wrong, but I can't. Yeah, I mean, maybe, I don't know whether somewhere in America might have, you know, like Garfield or Snoopy or something. Yeah, but, my, my, as, soon as, as soon as it came out of my mouth, I was like, there must be a Tintin statue or something yeah, somewhere, Belgium, you know. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. But I think that's part of the thing that um, obviously all the kind of um, – the, the sort of DC Thompson comic strips, whether it's the Beano or the Dandy or, or Willie or the Bruins, are all in their own kind of parallel worlds, but they're all Dundee at the same time. <laughs> See, as a kid, I, I, like it, it surprised me when I found out that these were essentially made in Scotland as well, because I, I don't know. I think it's, maybe it's that self-deprecating thing that, that you sort of touched on. I didn't think that something like that would come out of Scotland as a kid. You know what I mean? You, you assumed that it came from down south rather yeah. than that th th we were doing that up here. And I love that it's been embraced. Um, I'll, I'll th th we've kind of sort of started already, but I'll so you've mentioned that, you know, growing up in Dundee. So what was it like as a kid Look, growing up in Dundee? First of all, I'm slightly fraudulent because <laughs> um, I'm from Broughty Ferry, which is obviously um, to some people not Dundee. Uh, in the same way, you know, that a, a Letha might say they're not Edinburgh. Um, but yeah, Broughty Ferry, um, lovely place. And I think, do you know what is very typical of this? When you're growing up there, you just think, oh, this is, this is just life, isn't it? And yeah. you don't kind of, you know, oh, there's a castle. Oh, we're, we're next to the river. Oh, go five minutes that way. You can be out in the country. And I, I remember as a teenager being like desperate to go somewhere else. And my mum still lives there. And whenever we go now with the kids, part of it's in my head about, 
you know, um, oh, is there a way we could kind of live here? And because my career is kind of based in the central belt, it's just a bit too far away to make that work. But I try to go there, you know, as much as I can. And I, I just think, yeah, you, you don't, and I guess this is the same wherever anyone grows up, that you always have more appreciation for it when you're not there than when you are. So where I live now, um, I'm two, two two and a half years ago now, um, moved um, from where I lived to uh, North Berwick in East Lothian, which is very similar to Brotty Ferry in a lot of ways. You know, it's on the sea. Um, it's a sort of nice little town. The difference is, whereas Brotty Ferry was right next to Dundee, I now have like a 24-mile trek into Edinburgh. But, you know, that in itself is like a thing that tourists come to do. You know, if you think if you drive from here to Edinburgh, you can go, one of the ways you can go is through Gullen and you're driving through the middle of a golf course. And yeah. that's just, you know, that's quite spectacular. That's what American tourists come here for. It's always um, full of them. Or, you know, I can see North Berwick Law from the window of my house. You know, that's pretty spectacular. And the Bass Rock is out there. And all these things that you kind of see on postcards. And um, yeah, and then you get to Edinburgh for work. And if you go in by train, you get off the train. It's like, oh, there's Edinburgh Castle. That's another kind of like postcard thing. And it comes back to that whole kind of taking it for granted thing. These are things that tourists from around Scotland, around the UK, around the world come to see. And they're all, because we're, fortunate enough to live in Edinburgh, the surrounding area, they're all just here. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I think a lot of the tourist attractions, people who, who live here have probably never visited them. But, you know, um, it's, yeah, it, it's, I just think that in itself, sometimes you need to kind of pause for a moment and just kind of look around and think um, we are very lucky whatever else is going on and I know that you know times are tough in so many ways at the moment but if times are going to be tough um you'd rather times were tough being somewhere that you can go and have a walk and it's yeah you know there's a lot of things to look at rather than you know being you know you just need to put your put the news on and see what people are dealing with and Ukraine at the moment, you know, so um, count your blessings on that. The other thing I think being from somewhere that's next to a city, but is a small town and now living somewhere that's a little bit further away from a city, but is a small town is to international tourists, Scotland is basically about Edinburgh and the Highlands, yeah. but there is so much more to it than that and so many places that you know in the last 23 years of working in the news I was a child when I started obviously <laughs> um you know you I must mean, have been yeah, barely walking at the time <laughs> I know yeah I, I I was born with the microphone in my hand and I know uh, the feeling <laughs> yeah so there's all these places um and we can maybe get on to some of them, but there's so many places that are kind of off the beaten track or, you know, people don't necessarily think about that are well worth a visit. You, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's so many things that you touched on there that I couldn't agree more with. Like, I'm very lucky, you know, part of what I do is I get to look up Scottish history, Edinburgh history, and just talk about it and things. And there's moments where... You know, I go, oh, this, this isn't really very old. It's only a couple of hundred years old when I'm talking about, say, the new town. And then you forget that America is like the, the America that, you know, the, the, now 250 is when they got their independence and when, when they sort of founded themselves as they are now. And you go, that's, we've got buildings older than that. <laughs> you know what I mean? The oldest part of Edinburgh Castle is a thousand years old. It's in um, St. Margaret's Chapel. And uh, we, we, when you actually start to look at things, you're like, oh my 
we're really touching history just by walking down the street sometimes. Um, and I, I'm a big fan of East Lothian. I'm a massive fan of East Lothian. I think it's, 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 it's such a beautiful, beautiful area that you're right, that people need to get a chance to go and explore. We, we as I'm sure you're it's probably very familiar with. Is until I lived here, it was probably one of the parts of Scotland that I had rarely visited because, you know, maybe if you were driving up from, you know, the border, you'd come up the A1, you know, it's basically just to a lot of people, the bit you drive through to get to Edinburgh, but yeah. it's definitely worth stopping and having a, a proper look at it. There's so many inland, you know, there's places like Gifford and the, you know, down uh, that way, lovely sort of country walks and all of that. And then, you know, Haddington, historic market town, just outside Haddington, the um, the tower there, I don't know if you've ever been up to the top of that. It's um, pretty frightening, actually. <laughs> uh, it was very high and there's a sort of spiral staircase up the inside and you're not sure when you get to the top, but those barriers are quite high enough. But um, great views from up there, which actually reminds me, and this is a bit of sort of jumping across the map, um, in West Lothian, there's a place at the back of Bathgate called Cairn Papel Hill. If you go up to the top of there on a clear day, from the top of there, you can see Arran and North Berwick Law. So you can see the east coast of Scotland and the west coast of Scotland from the same place. Wow. And I think that in, in some ways, you know, Scotland is in some ways quite a big place, but it also shows you the sort of compactness, particularly yeah. the central belt, that you can see that from one place, the west and east. Not at the same time, unless your eyes point in different directions, but... But still, the fact part, that you could stand yeah. at one point and look one way and yeah. see one side of Scotland and then turn round yeah. and see... that's It does show you sometimes the, the, the how, challenge, how small of course, we are. Is finding a clear enough day that you can do it, but um, it is possible, and I have done it. Yeah, that, that's a different thing. I mean, it, it, it's one of the things that I always tell everyone, if you're coming here, bring a jacket, because, you know, the weather's going to change. <laughs> you, you, if you're going to be up there, you're going to have to wait for a while if you get a clear time to see it all. <laughs> the, the other bit, like East Lothian, well, like it really is the golf coast. Like you were saying, going through the golf courses, we, we used to drive, not so much now, but, you know, when we were trying to get Lillian to sleep when she was a baby go for a drive and it would settle her down and we used to go out East Lothian a lot driving through Gullin and you're like I'm literally driving through where they do the Scottish Open because you drive through the course yeah. <laughs> it's incredible well yeah so along that coast obviously going uh, kind of back the way from here the North Berwick there's three courses there I think and then Archer Field um, the Muir Field Gullin Kill spin the Aber Lady. It's yeah. If you're into golf, and um, I'll say this very quietly, I'm not. Um, yeah, great. Um, my mum actually um, is a very good golfer, and um, but I've never kind of uh, got the the bug myself. I don't think I quite have the patience to try and get that tiny ball into an even tinier hole about half a mile away so I know, my, my dad's the same my dad's a massive golf was a massive golfer but i just i've just never i've never got the hang of it i've never really had what is the, it this the a good walk spoiled yeah yeah generally a good walk the walk spoiled by trying to find a wee white ball somewhere yeah. <laughs> but there's there's one fact i don't know if you know this is one fact that i love about east lothian in golf um the old course at musselborough but by the race courses there that course was where they decided the size of the hole that is now set the world over. And it's a brilliant story, and I love it, because I think they were going to have the Open there. They were going to have a competition there. And every where they had the competition, the hole used to be a different size. And they said, right, we need to set this. We need to set the hole. We'll do it this size. And then the Muscle Grove course, where it was going to be held, they went, well, we've only got one that's this size the hole cutter and they went right that's it that's that's the size we're going to set from now on just because that and that's now still the same set for all the way around the world and it's because at the time that's the size of hole cutter they had while we're on the subject of golf 
at the risk of name dropping, um, St Andrews is where I met President Obama. See, now that's that's like that, that's like a massive name drop right there. Yeah, I'm just... <laughs> yeah. he's probably on a podcast um, telling people that that's where he met me. Um, well, he so, does a podcast with Bruce Springsteen, yeah. so you know. Well, yeah, he was over for. Um, uh, in fact, I tell you what, why he was over there every year. Um, Josh Littlejohn, who's the guy behind Social Bite, a charity mm-hmm. that runs sandwich shops and has done a lot to uh, raise money to help with homelessness, um, has a, a kind of business awards event. Um, and the guest speaker that they had managed to get was Barack Obama. And as part of being over, he wanted to play golf at St Andrews. So the good thing about St Andrews Golf Course, the old course, is you know where the, the clubhouse is there, you get quite a good view down the 18th. So you could see him kind of coming up. So he was coming up and we managed to get a word with him. It literally was a word before (laughs) we got kind of like um, eased away by his his minders and- Gently pushed away. (laughs) But um, yeah, and again, that just shows you, you know, this is the person who until just a few years before that had been the most powerful person in the world yeah. and he came to Scotland and he knew exactly where he wanted to go and what he wanted to see and you know so it just it just shows you that um, you know the, the kind of international appeal of um, a lot of places so yeah for him uh, that was standard. yeah we're, we're, we're a small country with a big reach really aren't we with, with, yeah. with and of course you company. add on to the fact that um, everyone in America believes they have some Scottish connection. And I guess that there's plenty of people in the Scottish tourist industry will do nothing to dissuade them from that because <laughs> it's uh, a great way to get visitors. And it's, it's just great to see actually um, walking around um, Edinburgh city centre in particular, but if you go up to St Andrews or go to the Highlands, you're hearing more and more American accents again, which obviously yeah. the last couple of years, well, obviously 2020 was a big write-off. Last year, there were some came, but it was difficult with travel restrictions and things, but because that's opened up again, and I just think that's great for so many businesses that have, you know are really built around tourism and it's not just you know sometimes people find it difficult to feel sympathy for businesses but you know people need to remember the the tour guides or the people who run restaurants or you know some of the smaller these are all kind of independent people who you know that's their their livelihood is directly dependent on on visitors so it's it's great to see that as soon as people have been able to again, they are coming back. Yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. And it, I mean, uh, when the festival starts back properly again this year, because I know they did it last year, but it was smaller. But, you know, the tattoos back on this year, they're already building the, the big seating up on the Castle Esplanade. It's really good. It'd be nice to get it back to that hub again, really. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, for a long time, and you'll have heard them as well, during the month of August, a lot of people who have to live and work in Edinburgh moan about the festival getting in the way. And you would always hear people say, oh, maybe we could, uh, you know, get a break from it one year. I think it was kind of be careful what you wish for because yeah. um, it was definitely, definitely missed. Yeah, oh, it really was. Walking about town, because we kind of sort of started when we were doing our exercise, I used to like to, nice to take a nice big walk around with the dogs, and it was like a ghost town in August, like on 2020. It was just, you know, it didn't feel right. It just didn't feel right. Whilst we, we kind of touched on it as well, you and you've been talking about it as well, as a reporter, you must have got to, you know, journey around Scotland so many times. Is yeah. there areas that you just sort of look forward to getting back to, hopefully for a good news story? Well, one of the, the kind of unfortunate things in a way 
And, you know, my wife would tell you this, like if we're in the car somewhere, you know, I have this kind of map in my head of Scotland that's built through kind of news stories that I've done. And unfortunately, yeah. by the very nature of it being, used, you know, a lot of it would be like, oh, um, you know, we'll be going along, oh, so there was a murder down there or, you know, this happened up there. Um, so that can sometimes maybe colour your opinions uh, a little bit. But I think possibly the the place that sticks in my head most as the most beautiful place I've been to in Scotland um, is the island of Barra, which I first visited in, in kind of very sad circumstances because it was at the time of the, the Manchester arena bombing and sadly um, Ailey McLeod, a teenager from Barra, lost her life in that and myself and a cameraman colleague had to go to Barra to, to cover that and it was, you know, that was, that was very difficult and uh, that's not really one for kind of talking about just now but yeah. the location was definitely straight to, uh, very shortly after being there. It's like, this is somewhere I've got to come back to as a visitor. You know, the, 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 the kind of location, they say, you know, some of the locals kind of nickname it Barabados because on a summer's day, it looks like the Caribbean. Like, you know, you see the, the plane that you can fly in from Glasgow to Barra lands on the beach because there's not an airstrip. And, you know, the sand is like very clean and the, the water is like very blue. And it, it's just, and the, because of where it is in the North Atlantic, you know, on a, on a non-windy day, and they do get non-windy days, um, it's just spectacular. And it's one of those places, I think almost people who know about it don't want to tell too many people because it's like a kind of secret to some degree. Yeah. And, you know, they want to keep it to themselves, but I would like really, yeah, I urge anyone to, to go and uh, visit because it is just amazing. Um, yeah, I was really taken by it. I'm going to have to go and after we've finished this conversation, look up how the planes land on the beach now, though. You do know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on um, uh, YouTube or other popular video sharing sites and you'll see videos of it. It's, it's pretty spectacular. I'm no, I, I don't know how I didn't know that. I, I'm going to have to check out. The, that's the, the other thing that is an experience that will never leave me is the being on the plane to take off from the beach you know, and you're looking out the window and you're along it, you're just like thundering along over sand and uh, you take off and yeah. And because of where it is, there's kind of big expanses of water that you fly over, but then you can see like numerous other islands and yeah, it's just, just amazing. Yeah. But it's definitely, I'm going to have to see, I'm bad and I will, I've admitted it many times. I love Scotland. I love to talk about it. I love to share stories from it, but I haven't explored it enough. I just haven't, which is, and I think we're all probably a little bit guilty of that. You, I don't think you tend to explore no, your home country as much. Absolutely, because I, I think one of the, if there have been any benefits of what we've all been through in the last couple of years, it's maybe been that people have looked at what's closer to them more because they hadn't been able to go abroad and um there are so many places that uh, and we all know there's the obvious places you know like the isle of sky which in the summer you cannot move because it's so popular yeah but there's every kind of every part of scotland has got stuff in it that's worth visiting and I, the other thing is if you live pretty much anywhere in Scotland, there is nowhere that you couldn't, within an hour, drive somewhere that's completely different yeah. from where you live. And you, you, that's that's a great thing. Yeah. So what, what was it like for you as a kid then? Was it, was it stay, staycations or did you...? Well, so um, my um, 
great aunt and uncle, um, they had, um, uh, this is the, the the big kind of like, a lot of 80s kids were related to this. They had like a, a caravan, you know, a static caravan thing in the Highlands, a place called Canusi, which is like right. near Aviemore. Um, and we would um, go there from time to time because they basically would go there for like the entire summer pretty much. And right. um, so that, because my mum um, was a big golfer, that was like kind of on the golf course almost that so. Because um, I, I remember um, there's a, I'm going to call it a mountain, right? I suspect it's probably a hill that <laughs> overlooks... If you were a kid, then it was definitely yeah, a mountain. It overlooks, um, can you see, golf course. I want to say it's called Craig Beg, but I'd have to have to check that. But I remember climbing that. I say climbing, you know, we walked. Um, me and my brother and with my dad. And from memory, I must have been, I think I must have been about six and my brother was like four and a half and I went back um a couple of years ago and just from the, the sort of car park at the golf course looked up and thought oh, that's pretty impressive that we went up there when we were um six and four and a half and that sort of um sticks in my mind and in that area um there's another place that I remember we went to, um, which is still there now, in Car Bridge. You know, there's a place called Landmark, which is like this sort of forest adventure place that you kind of climb trees and whatever. And there, for anyone who's been or anyone who's seen the advert, will know there is a massive kind of like tower in the forest that you can climb up to the top of and see kind of like the area. And I remember going up that as a kid. I thought, yeah this is great look at all this and i took my kids there but three four years ago and they were like oh this is fine and i was absolutely terrified and uh you know this sort of fear of heights um you just don't have that as a kid and um yeah so that sticks in my head um and so that that was a a, a definitely um somewhere we went um, quite a lot um, in the holidays as um, as kids. So um, definitely um, big fan of the. I, I, I'm going to pick you up on your use of the word staycation, though, because a staycation yeah. to me is you're off work and you're going to stay in your own house and do day trips. But people have adopted it now to be... Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I've adopted it to meaning staying in Scotland. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. Staying in the house, really. But you see, the thing is for me, if I if we end up having what, what you're saying, the proper use for a staycation is, it usually means I'm doing some sort of housework. <laughs> I'm doing some sort of decorating or something like that, which is usually what happens if we end up staying in the house. There's someone else that we went a couple of years ago um, that's, uh, that was lovely is um, Fintorn, just up in the, the north coast of um, Murray. Um, again, um, there's a lot to do up there, whether it's kind of, you know, water related or forest related or, yeah. Um, that was uh, really good. And um, Findhorn is just up the road from um, uh, Forest, um, where, which is where my, um, my colleague Kay Nicholson is from. You should get her on. She's a very big advocate of lots of places in Scotland. And um, I'm writing, I'm writing yeah. notes to remind myself. Oh, and she gave me a big list of here's all the places you should go and see. And this is becoming a bit of a theme now. There was a tower there as well that we went up. So, um, yeah, if, if there's a tower, much as they terrify me, I, I kind of have to have to climb it. But there is, like you touched on earlier, though, there's something about Scottish buildings. Scott Monument is, is a great example of this. The staircase is always really windy. It always gets smaller and smaller. And then, like you said earlier, you stand at the top and say, is this safe? Yeah. Well, and the um, the steps, because of the number of people who've been up them 
at all these places over the years, you know, they're always kind of like rubbed away at the edge. So the profile is like kind of that. And, mm. Or the, the spiral is, yeah, you're trying to stay to the the inside as much as possible because you think, yeah. Um, there's something that there's one of these, I don't know if you know this, well, old buildings the in Scotland, every seventh step is a slightly different height. So that it's very slight. It's only like maybe an inch or so. But it's so that if someone was robbing, they would get in a, a rhythm of running and then they would trip because it was a different height. So uh, John Knox House has got it on the Royal Mile. The, the, some of the, I think I want to say seven or ten. I can't remember exactly. But one the, every now and again, the step is a different height. So that if you're a thief, you're going to trip. Well, you've just uh, you've just given that away now. So uh, I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> the, the owners of uh, any old houses, if they get robbed, they'll uh, they'll know it was you, um, or, or someone who's wondering why they were clumsy every time they walked home. <laughs> yeah. So another place I went last year, a group of about ten of us from STV uh, to raise money from the STV appeal went to uh, the island of Cumbrae, um, which I had never been to before, but obviously for people from Glasgow in the West, you know, um, going there uh, is a kind of big thing. And, uh, you know, you go to Largs and get the ferry. And, um, yeah, that was great. We um, cycled around it. Um, and it's 10 miles for a lap. Um, right. And it's, it's quite flat, though. Because I had done most of my kind of training for the cycle around here, and obviously the one thing you will know about the roads around East Lothian is they're not flat. No. Um, but in a hundred miles of you know, so ten laps of Cumbria, there was less elevation change in that than I had in about eight miles around sort of North Berwick and East Linton. So um, yeah, so in some ways. You think, oh, well, that's quite easy then because it's flat, but the the wind picked up midway through the day and it suddenly became really difficult. But again, that was somewhere I'd never been before. And you kind of think, well, Scotland, it's not that big. There can't be that many places you've never been to, but there are loads. And yeah. I don't think it would be possible to visit everywhere. And I'm sure there are plenty of places that I've never been that I should go to. So, um yeah, that was um, that was good. And uh, just at Easter there, we uh, during the school holidays, uh, the quite fortunate thing is Easter holidays, as you'll know, in different parts of Scotland, the, the weeks that they fall in are yeah. just slightly different. So fortunately, the school holidays here um, went on into the week after the ones in um, sort of Perthshire and Dundee. So we were able to go up there to the holidays and it was quite quiet because all the kids were back at school. So we stayed um, just near Blair Athol and um, we went up the uh, the Falls of Brewer. If you've ever driven up the A9, you'll know that there is a, a well-known shop that has a restaurant and sells kind of tweedy stuff that's yeah. quite expensive. Lovely, but expensive, but it's a... A great place to, to have a look around. Um, behind that, Falls of Brewer, the sort of waterfalls and the, the walk up um, up there, um, it's quite quite tricky in places. You're just, yeah, keeping away from the edge, but that was that was really good. And um, just further down from that, uh, Pit Lockery, the, the uh, power station with the dam. There's a visitor centre there, and you can go a bit further around Loch, Fis Loch Fiscali and um, swim in the loch. Um, so I um, watched my wife and uh, son swim in the loch. Had to, I love uh, how that changed. I'm so excited to look you, know, you told me boat. cycling, and then you're like, I watched my family yeah. do it. <laughs> I think you know. Um, I, I do like to, the sort of open water swimming, but only in the summer. I, I'm, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that whole area is the, the hermitage just at the, at Dunkeld. Um, uh, again, somewhere that for me had been somewhere I'd seen on a sign for years and years and years and never stopped off to go. And there's a bit there you can go and walk right up 
and uh, there's this kind of lookout bit and you can see kind of like up the up the A9 and whatever and it just it's quite satisfying to have kind of oh we're a long way up here yeah so that was a, a another place um the bit of Scotland oddly that I would say I've visited least um although my dad was originally from a boy in Aberdeenshire that the, the sort of northeast part so you know go as far as uh, Dundee because that's where my mum is but I would always if I was thinking about going somewhere in Scotland on holiday default to going either to kind of like the highlands or somewhere on the west coast and so that bit uh, you know sort of northern Angus Aberdeenshire and sort of around the um the sort of northeast coast is a bit I need to go and um, see more of. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I think I've been to Aberdeen once. And I've been to, you know, Pilockery somewhere where we end up a lot. I think whenever we're going up north, for some reason, we always hit Pitlockery and we always stay there, probably just because it's... It's like the halfway drive. point to anywhere. It's kind of like the start. The, 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 I feel like you can get from anywhere north of Pitlockery. You can get there really easily from there. But Aberdeen, for some reason... I mean, you're you're right. You kind of forget about that part of Scotland a little bit by no fault of its own. You just sort of almost a blind spot, really, isn't it? I did some filming actually last year in um, that Royal D side, so um, near Balmoral Castle, your Ballater and Bankery, and that drive actually from Aberdeen along that way. That is it's lovely, and you get these towns. You know, they're all really nice and they probably deserve uh, more of this. Obviously they're not short of tourists because the Royal Connection brings a lot of people in. Yeah. But again, it's just that thing of there are places you would, I think where it comes from is because of growing up in Brody Ferry, you would think of going that up that side as being almost too near to count somewhere that you'd gone on holiday so yeah. you would gravitate to going you know the west coast or the highlands or yeah yeah maybe i, I was thinking about why i've never been there for a second i'll start to i'll start you I know to you've got, a road trip and we can all go i know and I, I tell you it's one of the things I, I love driving and you see when you're driving in scotland it is just spectacular. It really, really is. I mean, I, 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 don't, I get a lot of messages from people wanting hints about driving on the other side of the road rather than thinking. But it is one of those things when you're just driving and you're looking at the hills or a loch or just the trees on a hill, the colours, the, it almost looks like a watercolour paint in half the time you want, you're going about Scotland. Like the amount of times you take pictures and you're like, no filter needed. This is what it looks like. You know what I mean? We're very lucky in that sort of way. Well, and we've seen that as well, that um, it's not just, as I said before, it's not just Edinburgh and the the, um, the Highlands. Glasgow is obviously um, becoming a, a big destination for people making Hollywood films and pretending it's America because yeah. of that grid system in the city centre. But that in itself is going to bring more tourists in because people will want to see the place where that film was made. Yeah, and it does seem like more and more films are getting getting made there. Um, obviously, Batman most recently, but going back, World War Z was made there and everything. There's so many great films have been filmed there. Um, I'll start to round up because I know, obviously, you've got, um, you've got little ones as well. So uh, I'm very lucky people watch and listen from all around the world. And like we've kind of touched on, people with Scottish heritage or things like that, and they're planning trips over, what would be your top tips for anyone coming over to Scotland? Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, first thing is, I think, give yourself enough time to see places better to, you know, fully appreciate somewhere for a few days than trying to cram too much in I think, you know, you see a lot of these tour buses going around that try and do the whole country in five days. Yeah. You can't. Um, go to places that are away from the, the kind of obvious ones, um, I think is a, another 
tip. You know, we've we've not even talked about uh, of all the places we mentioned, we've not even talked about Stirling. You know, Stirling is pretty much right in the middle of Scotland, and another kind of very historic place, spectacular around there. You know, from there you can go obviously up to Perth, up at Lockway, or you go the other way, the Trossachs and whatever, the West Coast, or come down to, to Edinburgh. So that's a good place. Um, don't believe people who say that the food's terrible. You know, a lot of us eat terrible food, but a lot of Scottish chefs are, um, you know, right up there best in the world you know so i, I, I love that idea that it's not that the food's terrible it's just that our diet as scots is yeah. terrible <laughs> yeah. although um of course there's some things about that that are a myth you know tourists think everyone eats deep fried mars bars i've never seen one and the only time i've ever tried one was i made one in here literally for a video that's the only time i've tried it <laughs> and it was okay <laughs> However, I, think, I yeah. did I did ruin my deep fat fryer. <laughs> but yeah, I think absolutely the the thing is, um, yeah, do your research and um, have a think about places kind of off the beaten track. Every day, um, I'll read about somewhere or see a video about somewhere that I've not been and think, you know, that 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 looks like somewhere that would be good to go. The other bit. Scotland, aside from the northeast, the other bit of Scotland I've not really been too much is the the southwest, you know, like Ayrshire and Dumfries and Galloway, and mm. that's somewhere I, I probably need to kind of explore a bit more as well. So. Yeah, I think the truthfully, and this is being completely honest, the only time I'm really in that sort of area as a kid would be when my dad was driving us down to Blackpool for a holiday. That'd be the only time we'd sort of pass that sort of region, really. Um, I like to finish off with what I call um, difficult questions for us Scots. So this okay. is where we this is where we really get a chance to, to, to see what you're made of. Again, you know, the difficult questions, generally, I prefer to be the one asking them. But... <laughs> Shortbread or tablet? Shortbread. Well, that, was, that was decisive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, 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 no, the, the, just not a fan of the big sugar in the in the tablet. No, I, it's, it's just one of those things I've I've never liked. You know, um, things like you know fudge and toffee are quite nice, so let it be that tablet. It's just no, not for me. I, I do love I do love a nice bit of shortbread and a nice nice big glass of milk, and I'm just I'm I'm happy I'm happy. Milk um, is the thing, right? I hated milk as a child to the extent that. I wouldn't even have it on cereal. And now, you know, um, uh, yeah, big, big fan. So, What did you have on your cereal then? Do you know, I, I, I don't know. I must have <laughs> avoided having cereal. Um, I have heard that people, of people using water instead of milk, but maybe I can't I imagine that. Nice. have some, I don't know whether this is an invented memory, some memory of having like, you know, cornflakes or frosties with hot water just to make them soggy because I didn't like milk. And I think I then probably, you know, graduated to Cocoa Pops because they made the milk chocolate so it was at least tolerable. But yeah. there's absolutely no way that I would have drunk a glass of milk. I would just, no. And, um, yeah, no, now I love milk. But it has to be, you know, proper kind of blue milk. None of your yeah. uh, kind of watery skim milk nonsense. If you've got to do it, do it right. Like, there's another unusual thing I could tell you that I do not, and people think this is weird, I just don't like the taste. I don't drink tea and coffee. It makes life a lot easier. But, um, yeah, and again, I don't know if I will one day just suddenly think, no, I do like it. But if I was going to drink coffee... I would ha it would have to be kind of like proper coffee and have it black. You know, if you're going to do it, do it right. But I'm not there yet. See, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a whole Scottish mission as well on that whiskey. You've beat me to my next question. Okay, I was going, right. My next question Let's was going to be... I didn't say that. Just uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but I'll, I'll jump quickly back. I'm with you. I'm half with you. I can't touch coffee. I don't get it. I just I don't like get the it. smell of coffee. Yes, it's not worth making. I like the smell. You know, that's a childhood memory. There was a place in Dundee. I want to say, I'm trying to think of the street name. So one of the streets going down from the high street 
um, it had a TV shop in it, but next to the TV shop was a coffee roasters. And if you stood outside there, you would smell the kind of roasting coffee beans. And that I always distinctly remember that. Some days you'd walk past and they'd taken it a bit far and it was kind of burnt smell. But other times, you know, that, that smell of roasting coffee, delicious, but drink it, no. I was going to say, like I said, you've kind of sort of touched on this already, but the next one was Iron Brew or Whiskey? Neither. Neither? I'm, I'm obviously not a real Scot. I do <laughs> not like Iron Brew. I've never liked Iron Brew. Whiskey, they say it's an acquired taste, and I've just not acquired it yet. It is. that I, I'll be honest, I am just learning. I'm tr like deliberately trying to learn how to appreciate whiskey because... It, 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 it's not something I drank in, in my younger days. I and don't know it's... to what degree it's inherited. Uh, so my mum does not, to this day, like whiskey. Um, my dad, he used to drink um, like proper, like single malts, you know, Glenfiddich and all that, and like mm. with the merest suggestion of water and whatever. But no, it's not. It's not something that I have acquired yet. Uh, right, move, I'm going to move. Uh, uh, haggis, neeps, or tatties, or mints and tatties? Um, as a child, mints and tatties was something you'd have, you know, with dough balls in it as well. Um, probably like at least once a week. And um, I remember my great aunt, who I said earlier, had the caravan in Canusi. If you go to her house, she would make it, but she would always like. It was always kind of like messed about with mints, you know. There was like random stuff in it, like <laughs> Campbell soup and whatever, or whatever. But you know, it's an underrated, um, underrated dish with some tassies. But haggis, leeks, and tassies. I think it's more of a kind of special occasion thing, isn't it? Whereas the mince tassies is your kind of like. Work. It's your staple food, really. Mince and tassies yeah. is, is is a lad yeah. or a I think people school. probably don't have it to the same degree now but um i can't remember the last time i had it it's but. one of those things and i've mentioned it a few no i, I can't remember last time i had it either um but haggis heaps and tatties it's never the same anywhere else like from house to house yeah you know. cause everyone has their own um technique and yeah recipe do you um put an onion in the pan first or do you brown the mince first do you yeah. add artificial kind of gravy browning to it or do you not do you put peas in it do you not do you put carrots in it that's the divisive one um yeah i wouldn't put carrots in it peas but no carrots People yeah do. um has to be served with white pepper not really black, but white <laughs> pepper yeah i've never heard that i've never heard that i don't even know if See, my, my mum's passed away now, so I couldn't ask her how she used to make her mints and tatties, unfortunately. So, but however, I will say, I don't remember ever seeing white See, pepper in our house ever. Like, because um, I think in the last sort of 20 years, we've all learned a lot more about food. You're, it's more likely that your mints and tatties, if you're going to make it now, you know, you'd make it a bit more interesting by a putting like a Korean spice paste in there or yep. making it like a kima curry or something, you know, um, or of course the ubiquitous um, bolognese. Um, yeah. Uh, people don't tend to just have plain mince in the same way. As but then the thing is, well, that, that, that stodgy food, that high, that, that mince and tatty sort of thing is because, you know, we, we, we live in a country where half the time it's freezing cold. Yeah, so, you know, you were the people were making food that was going to help them stay warm, essentially give them you know body yeah. fat to stay warm. So, I, I think a lot of countries, when you look at their diet, maybe not now with the thing, but that's you know you understand their diet by the environment that they're living in. Really, yeah. that that helps. Uh, last question: um, Tunnock's tea cakes or caramel wafers? Snowballs. <laughs> Snowballs, because what's the best bit of a tea cake? It's the squidgy stuff in the middle, right? Yeah. So if you have a snowball, that's just that. With coconut added in. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it has to be because I think there's a few different manufacturers of snowballs, and obviously, um, as an impartial broadcaster, I can't endorse one or the other. But um, some of them maybe lean a bit more towards the kind of you know those like macaroon bars that are made out of potatoes and coconuts. Yeah. Some of them lean a bit too much towards that. But you want the kind of nice, clean sort of marshmallowy, creamy stuff. If you could buy, um, like, just a tub of that, that would be fine. Maybe <laughs> See, someone, that, that, that's a marketing idea for someone it, it, now. So, <laughs> tub of that, tub of the popular um, chocolate nutty spread. Yeah. Uh, you know, dip in there, dip in there, boom, delicious. <laughs> See, someone, someone's going to do don't it. Tell, do don't it tell the dentist. No. <laughs> Gordon, this has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you for coming on and sharing your time. I have to say, like, it, it, it's been a joy listening to you because your knowledge about Scotland from from obviously your thing, your your career has been a joy to listen to the, the stories and the areas of Scotland that you know. So, thank you for taking the time and coming on and sharing them with me. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, go and look up videos of planes landing at Barra Beach. That was great. Gordon's obviously got such a, such a, a, a wealth of knowledge about Scotland and so many different areas of Scotland. It was great to have him on and just truthfully just sit back and let him share some of the knowledge and, and things he knows what's going on around about Scotland. And, and they, Gordon, thank you so, so much for coming on and sharing your time it was a it was a real pleasure to have you on if you've enjoyed that guys as always please remember leave a like leave a comment share and uh, as always please try to leave a review uh, wherever you get your podcasts as well or if you watch on youtube remember to subscribe but look after yourself till next time bye humans mm -hmm.